I'm Johnny Page. I'm Matt Verlek. And this is the South County Podcast. So Matt, you and I were, yesterday we spent like six and a half hours together in a quarterly planning session. Well, it was annual planning and quarterly planning, yep. um, which arguably, you know, risky to put you and I in a room with a spreadsheet and a, uh, what, you know, and an <laughs> iPad for that long. Um, but we're getting better at it. We're getting more disciplined. You know, it's yeah. fewer and farther between that we come out of that room and, you know, want to go a completely different direction with the company. But um I think that there was a moment in our planning session where things got could have gotten a little heated, yeah, um, contentious, and uh, out of that, you know, we ended up having a really good and productive and extremely high value. Like what, what came out of that conversation, I think we both have a lot of confidence mm-hmm. in. But I think you, you and I both observed that that was probably not the norm. Yeah. in in most working relationships and something we wanted to uh, to bring to the podcast today so um we think we titled it or at least commented on hey we were more interested in getting it right than being right but uh why don't you why don't we walk through what 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 was happening in that moment and uh you know what the high road looked like versus you know the the low road yeah like doing this right is built on a foundation of trust Right. And around something that's near and dear to my heart, right? API, assume positive intent. Like we talk about that a lot in our company. And so I think actually the logical place to start when it comes to like, like the question at hand is how do you get comfortable getting your ideas challenged? Right. I think that's the, that's the question that we're wrestling with here. Um, And it doesn't happen without a high degree of trust. And so, you know, I think that humans in general, right, when you come up with an idea, you want to love your idea. You want to feel like, hey, I've came up with the way, I've made this improvement on this thing, whether it's a business or a process or, or literally anything. Um, and then it's that nerve wracking moment when you circulate it with people, you know, like in, in our case, you know, someone that I really respect and I also like for big decisions, you and I need to be on, you know, aligned and on the same page. I, I hate consensus, but in the in the context of you and me as a partnership running this company, it's it's what it is. Um, and so that's like psychologically for anyone who has a plan, that's like that big moment where you put it in front of someone. And you're like, oh, I hope this person likes it. Or like if you're if you're a team member, it, it's could be bringing it to your boss or doing a presentation about it. But either way, it's like that moment where you're you're putting your chips down and it's and you're exposing yourself to be vulnerable, right? Which I think that's where that whole like quiet quitting thing comes from. It's mm-hmm. just people are not necessarily engaged enough to want to be vulnerable because to yeah. innovate you have to be vulnerable um yeah just to even share the idea like we could talk about what what even allowed for there to be the environment to like go out on a limb and you know share this idea that alone can be a challenge for some leaders in getting the team to a point yeah. where they're willing to take risk and share the idea let alone you know having an environment where it's okay if that idea is challenged and you know feelings aren't hurt and we we keep on focus on the main thing Totally. And, and so I think that, you know, in this case, you know, I think that we had a, a, a you know, a, a project inside the business that I don't think is executing as well as it could be. And I had an idea about how we can improve it in 2024. And it was one of those things that I think was substantially correct, but also needed some refinement and some some further innovation. And so I think, like you showed up to that conversation really, really well. Um because we have the kind of trust that we have. And it, it was just this interesting moment. You know, one of the things emotionally that I've been working on is this like this whole concept of like, you're not your feelings, right? Where it's like, you know, if you're, if you're in a good headspace, not to get all woo woo or whatever, it's like, isn't this about SAS? But you know, if these conversations are what build sustaining businesses though. Right. And so it's almost like if you're in your feelings to like be able to zoom out for a second and be like, I see you self feeling this way versus like, Oh, I'm consumed with all these feelings, you know? And so I could like, I could see myself having this like low key feeling of like, damn, like I really just wish that Johnny was like, yo, great idea. Let's go do it. (laughs) Um, you know, and, and it was interesting because we beat that idea up for an hour, hour and a half and where we landed was both in my opinion, better than where it started and also 
substantially similar to where we started, right? It wasn't that the whole concept was wrong. It was just that there was a couple of things that needed to mm-hmm. iterate it on. But I think it was just, you know, like we said in the in the little title or what whatnot, right? Like it was we were both more concerned with getting it right than I was concerned with you liking my idea for some type of validation that I needed. Mm-hmm. And I think for yeah. me personally, I'm interested in your viewpoint on this too, but for me personally, getting it right, like, you know me, I'm the data guy. Like for me, it's like having the numbers to illustrate when we got it right. It helps counteract so much of like the natural emotion of putting ideas out there and being vulnerable. Like we could both be wrong. I could be right. You could be wrong. You could be right. I could be wrong. Who the hell knows? But the numbers Mm -hmm. know. So it's like, let's just figure out what to try in, you know, in support of getting the numbers from A to B. And yeah. so I think that like once we're aligned behind that common goal, it helps me at least defuse it emotionally um, because we're all after the same thing. So I don't know. I thought it was kind of like a a beautiful exercise in both like vulnerability, trust and, you know, trying to get the best outcome for our clients, which is what yeah. the whole game is. Yeah. You know, dude, I think a, a sign of a high performing team is one that has healthy conflict. Yeah. Like we don't actually produce a better idea unless I'm not scared to challenge your idea and you're not open to feedback. Right. And if you you could take this, sure, this time it produced a great outcome, but the no matter what, whatever comes out of that, like there's two scenarios. One, you change your idea in a way and or your idea evolves in a way that we are all feel like we, there's more consensus. So like you and I leave that conversation of like, hey, we we both feel like we participated and you know how we got there was just as important as like where we ended up. So you could have changed your idea. You you could have not changed it at all. And just the right. openness to having the conversation and why'd you choose this way now leaves us in more alignment than if you had just like said, Hey, here's what I'm doing. So, you know, one, build consensus on your team. Two, facilitate a culture where healthy conflict happens regularly like Mm -hmm. we say all the time you know everyone's hand is on the steering wheel there's not a single decision that gets made here where you are not endorsing it so like if you feel like we're about to run into a wall you gotta like you screaming from the rooftop man grab that steering wheel and keep us from hitting the wall you know your perspective matters here so building that you know the a environment where you feel like there's the trust and the safety to be the only person, you know, sharing a a contrarian perspective and that it's going to be well received. And that ultimately we all believe that we're getting it right versus being right. So like, you know, politics don't win here and your favoritism doesn't win. Like it's, it's getting the right idea. There's another side to it though, that I think is equally as important because listening to you walk through that, I agree with everything you laid out, but I think like for the people listening to this, it might be tempting for them to take from what you just said, like, okay, I need to go beat up every idea until we have consensus across mm-hmm. everyone who's involved in it. Right. And so I think like, you know, where I'm pointing is the disagree and commit philosophy. So why don't you walk through how we leverage that to also like land the plane in the case where we have multiple viewpoints? Yeah. I mean, ultimately you're the decision maker on that. So one of the tools that we'll use, like, let's just say that you and I and many times this has happened, we get into a, 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 you know, not an argument, but we are, we have two differing perspectives on how something yeah. should be solved. One of the things that we'll do to just get a sense for how important is this to you is we'll just rate it like, Hey, Johnny, you, know, you appreciate, I hear your perspective on a scale of one to 10, how important is this to you? And if I'm a, you know, I'll say, you know, I'm a nine or I'm a, I'm a three or a four, you know, a lot of times we found, Hey, this just ended up like not being super high, pro, you know, high high importance what we're arguing but hey if we both find we're both at nines it's super high priority ultimately if it's your air responsibility you got to go make the decision and whatever you decide from the time that we've had that conversation we've aired it all out you've heard my perspective you know how important this is to me when we leave that conversation i'm there to f- support your plan like because that's what's best for you know one of our core values is customer backwards like you are stewarding some part of our client experience through that decision and it's you know, it's my job to make sure that I got your back um, as you go, you know, execute regardless of whether or not I thought it was the way to go. 
Yeah. So it's not a, you know, I'm not rooting in the background, I'm not rooting for you to fail. Hey everyone, just wanted to take a second and say thank you for tuning into this episode. If you're enjoying what we're doing, I've actually got three things I'd love to ask you to do. Go on to Apple or Spotify, or wherever you're listening to the podcast. You can give us a rating is number one, drop a review. And then if you have a friend or a SaaS founder who you think could benefit from what we're doing here, we would love if you would share this episode. It would mean a ton to Johnny and to myself. Thanks so much. That's the really important part is like for people who've worked in companies that might not have the healthiest workplace culture, right? It's like, Oh, I told Johnny this wasn't going to work. So like, can't wait to see him fall on his face, you know, and then I'm going to be right. And then I can like use that to angle for a promotion. Like that's how some places work. It's bonkers to me. I just can't even imagine it being in that environment, right? Where, you know, it's the way we approach it is just, I'm, I'm going to say my piece. I'm going to explain and also seek to understand because I might have an opinion where I think you're incorrect. And then you lay out the data. And I'm like, okay, actually, I agree with you. Like that's happened in both directions more times than I can count. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, at the end of the day, you know, we call it a, a DRI, a directly responsible individual. Like every area of the business has one, not two, not five, one. And so if it's your area, it's your call. Leaders make bets yeah. and you get paid to be right. Um, so at the end of the day, you get to make the call. And then once everyone said their piece, we're all behind the decision because that's what a yeah. team does. So yeah, a couple, a couple of hacks. Like this is a skill that's got to be taught. It's earned your team. Yeah. Dude, you, you can hire someone and you get their hours and you get their effort. There is a whole nother level of engagement that is earned. You do not get to pay for that. And what we're talking about is a level of engagement. Like, dude, at the end of the day, what you were working on yesterday, it's not my problem. Like, it's not, it's not, it's not my area of responsibility. If you were to not be successful in that area, like it's not a direct reflection on me direct, you know, on me directly. Although you could make an argument like we are the, you know, so some, the team is some yeah. of all the individual parts, but you know, I'm highly engaged and I'm invested in every area of this business working out. And that's been earned by the culture we've created at, at the company. I think that as a leader, you've got to earn that as well. So a couple of hacks that you can do if, if you're trying to foster this type of open communication and healthy conflict. One of the things I've seen really helpful, Matt, is like when we're, when we're, let's say we're in a team setting, often said we're at quarterly planning and annual planning, you know, most of you listening have probably got some sort of meeting coming up that's going to talk about where we're going over the next three months or 12 months and, and why. And part of that, you're going to want to get enrollment from your team. What you can do is you can assign half the team, your black hat, you are going to poke holes in why this isn't going to work. So actually your job is to assume the contrarian role and the other yeah. half of the team, your white hat, you're going to figure out why will this work? And then we can flip roles and you kind of have this like, you know, proxy into get having, you know, assigning people that your role is to be the contrarian. And sometimes I can get the guard down, think about how well that, you know, receive that feedback. Well, you know, foster that open communication, use that as a stepping stone to more, these conversations happening more organically. Uh, Matt, that's what one that I've used frequently. I'm sure you have others. Like, what do you do to foster healthy conflict on your team? Yeah, I, I'll plus one what you just said. I think that assigning roles, right, whatever you name them is not important, but like, you know, telling a, f a handful of people it's your job to poke holes in this plan and another set of people it's your job to be the optimist and figure out all the ways this could be awesome. Like just assigning the roles decouples the role from like the personality, which is super helpful. And you can use that tool in so many areas. Like, and we have a framework inside of the academy, right? We teach that doing that for uh, sales call review, right? Where like, mm -hmm. if you were the sales leader, I was a sales rep, get two other people. One of them is to find all the stuff I did wrong. One of them is to find all the stuff I did right. And then it's not like someone being mean, it's just the role. Yeah. So I love that. The level of importance, I think, is one that cannot go understated because I think if you're operating a team with really high engagement, everyone is going to be engaged on everything. Um, but when you find that there's a mismatch, if it's a nine to you and a three to me, I'm just going to go with whatever you want, right? Because mm -hmm. if it was really, really important, it wouldn't be a three to me. And so yeah. why, why even waste time talking about it? So I think how important is this to you on a scale of one to 10 is a really good, um, a really good rule. I think the other one that is, is worth covering and it's not like a tactical, you know, hack that I can fit into a sentence, but it's something to just strive for over time is that like doing this right is based on having deep relationships inside a team. And so I think that it's really important to like architect your relationships at work to build trust and to 
go through like shared hardship together and come out the other side and and co-create some wins and just have real conversations and just like figure out how to build the connective tissue to the people next to you because you know it's really easy to say and you and I have talked about this at length right it's like it's really easy to say like the goals of the business are what unifies us but like when when the business is the thing that's off the rails which is not the case for us today but in general you know it can happen in any business there's going to be hard days hard months hard quarters like when the business is the stressor if that's the only thing unifying the team the team will no longer be unified right and that's mm-hmm. when people end up attacking each other and so i just think realizing that there's the hard skills of management, right? Your data and your KPIs and this and then that. And then there's the soft skills of leadership, which is having to actually build really strong bonds between the human beings on the team. Mm-hmm. And if you do both of those things, then you earn your way into always assuming positive intent and you earn your way into being comfortable with healthy conflict without feeling yeah. like you're getting personally attacked. And I think that once you get over those hurdles, that's when a team can really start to thrive and then your decisions become higher quality as yeah. a result. Yeah, dude, one of the most effective ways that we've built this, like for sure you should do one-on-ones, for sure you should look for the opportunities, but like I love drilling this down to like, look, man, you know, emotional intelligence and building trust. I need these like, you know, tactical, um, you know, practical application tools that I can use to, uh, uh, to build that. And one of the ones that we've done, and I learned this here was, a strengths and weakness ex- exercise. So you bring a team together and you you put, you know, 10 minutes on the clock. Let's just say there's five people on a team and we're going to uh, write each person's name down. We're going to draw a line down the middle. We're going to write strengths, one strength, one thing this person does really well, and one weakness, one yeah. thing that they could do to get to the next level. I um, mean, you got to, you know, one, write one down for each person and then one person, the leader should go first. So you can model how to receive feedback and everyone goes around and you share the one strength and the one weakness. And the only thing the person getting the feedback is allowed to say is thank you. So you just received the feedback and man, the trust that comes out of that and the vulnerability of that simple exercise, it can take 90 minutes, do it on a Friday afternoon and just watch the, organically some of that healthy conflict will come up because now there's a foundation of trust. There's a great book out there. I think it's Patrick Lincioni like the five dysfunctions of a team and talks about how trust is the foundation, man. You just, it goes so far and it's such a, you find it's such a rare thing to have in the workplace. Shockingly. Like I would say, if you're listening to this podcast and you're in a workplace where there is not trust, man, there are some out there where you can build trust and that's a part of the culture. I'd go find that because life is too short to spend time, you know, in an organization where you don't have uh, trust, but man, it goes so far to fostering those conversations and uh, out the other end, you wouldn't think you wouldn't tie the connection to be like, Hey, if we have a more trusting team, do we make better decisions? But dude, there's a direct correlation um so i don't know that's one that i've really enjoyed doing do, do it uh, probably two or three times a year and you want, um, you want to talk so, about the varsity version of that you want to talk about what we just did on our offsite <laughs> uh yeah we could do that i mean if you want look if you're not doing any of that yet start with where we just you know start where we just <laughs> yeah. started but uh yeah but, if you want to jump in the deep end tell them yeah if you want to know what like what i feel like the the max uh the max dose of this is um it's called a lifeline exercise. And essentially what it is, is you, you draw a graph, right? You take a piece of paper and you draw a graph and you walk through the ups and downs of your life and you essentially share your story, your life story with, with the people around you. The, again, to Johnny's point, this is not the zero to one move. Um, you know, cause you get out of it, what everyone puts into it. But, uh, I've done this twice in my career, once recently, um, and then once with my my first company up launch and both times they're two of the most memorable afternoons slash evenings of just like, I don't know what you would call it, bonding, learning, relationship building, admiration, like all of the things. Um, it's just, it's really... I just been blown away both times at like the vulnerability that everyone showed up with the trust that was built, the shared understanding that we left that room with. Um, yeah, it's just, it's crazy meaningful. So yeah, I feel yeah, like yeah. that's what the, uh, that's what the hundred mile an hour version of this looks like. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's special to be on a team that has such high trust and what comes out of that is, Hey, we get to get into a room and uh, we're working on a project or on a goal on a problem. And we get to trust that Matt's coming at this, trying to get it right. Johnny's yeah. coming at this, trying to get it right. And we can wrestle with the problem. It's me and you side by side against the problem, not me versus you. And dude, so, just getting to clear that, even from being a, a possibility allows us to do some really exceptional work and uh, man, building the SaaS company is not easy. There are lots of challenges uh, on, you know, every day you wake up and there are new challenges that come up. And so to build a, a culture and a team that's got high trust, that's focused on getting it right versus being right. It will be a wind at your back versus, you know, just a strong headwind of not being able to, you, you become at best a genius with a thousand hands. If you are a founder that doesn't foster a culture of trust. So yeah. I think in this time of year, people are naturally a little more cheery and, uh, and warm, you know, sometimes. use it to your advantage. <laughs> and, uh, sometimes, yeah. Uh, use it to your advantage, you know, especially schedule a Friday afternoon that uh, maybe do a strengths and weaknesses exercise. Uh, maybe, you know, when you're in your quarterly or annual planning, think of who's going to be the white hat and who's the black hat and let's practice, you yeah. know, some healthy conflict. Um, but, uh, yeah, man, I think these are some helpful tools, Matt, anything else to add? Yeah, I just just one. If if you're a founder or a CEO and you're not sure where you stand on this, the way that I would encourage you to think about it is like literally sit down and just get 15 minutes clear, take out a piece of paper and a pen and just over the past call it 3 months, make a quick list of all of the times that you've had an idea that someone on your team challenged in public, like in a meeting, not necessarily one-on-one, -on -one, right? Um and I think that if you don't have a list at all, if you can't think of a single time, that's worth double clicking on, right? Or are, you, are we building a culture where the team doesn't feel empowered to speak up or they're too nervous to speak up to you? Um, and then if you do have things on your list, give us some honest thought to how you showed up to that situation, both externally to the team and also how did you treat yourself during that engagement? Like, how did you feel? Did you feel personally attacked? Or did you feel like, oh, I'm so grateful that my team gives a shit, my team is engaged, that they're, they're willing to take the risks to challenge the CEO of the company or push on me to make a better decision, that kind of thing, right? So, so if you're in a leadership position, make the list, when, when have you gotten challenged by people on your team? And then how did you show up to it both internally and externally? And I think that like, if nothing else, that will orient you to maybe the opportunity that you have inside your company, inside your culture, inside yourself to, to tune up how you show up to these scenarios. Because I can tell you that if you have a solid team, every idea will be better when it gets through them versus if they sidestep it because they don't feel comfortable to challenge you. So I just think a little, little introspection on that topic can go a long way if you're not really sure where you stand. I love it, man. Cool. Good conversation. Yeah, brother. Good place to leave it. See ya. Yeah.